wonder if we can change gears a little bit because I, I see that we're already we've got 15 minutes left here. But I, I wanted to talk to you all about about access. So uh, for you know regular people uh, to be able to get access to uh, your funds, uh, and I, I mean the answer may be that it doesn't apply to this crowd because I know Gina, you know you're working with institutions; those are tax advantaged accounts. Um, so in that sense, I guess people do have access to through their pension fund. Um, but but on the private equity side, I mean, it, it, is it that you're at capacity anyway, and there's no desire to to kind of raise capital from from individuals? I know that there are there are sidecars involved in in these funds, and you know if you have a really good relationship, you can get into these um, you know hard to reach funds. But is there any desire to to make your funds easier to access for retail investors, or or not really? I'll talk to that for a moment, and I'm sure, Mike, you can add something. Uh, you know, the, 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 the major league players, and I'll take Blackstone as an example in private equity. So Steve Schwartzman is on record saying that he believes the future asset gathering is among the retail investor because the retail investor has so little exposure to private equity, and they should be there. So a big group like Blackstone is very focused on that. And Apollo just announced in the last week or two, they're doubling, and I think it's hitting like four, 40 people, just to go after retail investors. And the vanguards of the world are creating vehicles to put into private equity. So the retail investor, I think, is gonna be developing access to private equity. It's gonna tend to be the brand names, and the brand names are fine, and they do great, and that's why they're around, that's why they're brands. But I'll bet you Mike's returns and our returns are better uh, because we are, it's easier to be better at the lower middle market than at the, How hey. I, I don't know how they qualify them, but they're taking 50. Well, yeah, I mean, they're not going to the, yeah, yeah, these have to be accredited investors, but there, there's a lot of accredited investors who don't, who can't access private equity, and they're being given the tools, like, like you yeah, just I'll said. Give you a, I'll give you a tip. Just go buy BX. It's actually outperformed their fund. I'd rather own the GP than the LP, and you can buy that. You can put a thousand bucks in it if you want, but a great stock. I don't know if anyone pays, the dividends are unbelievable. All of them have performed great. Yeah. And that's, I didn't ever got to the third mega trend in our industry, which is exactly that. So what's happened is that the public markets, in our cases, billions of dollars of capital have been raised in funds by Blackstone and others just to invest in the smaller private equity funds. And this is a big thing. Uh, Almost every, not almost every, but many, many funds, and we keep resisting it, I'm sorry, I think Mike's keep resisting it, are knocking on our door and saying, keep what you got, but we'll monetize the next 25, 40 years of your ability to raise capital and deploy capital and own a piece of your future. Yeah, and, and, and that's a mega trend in our industry. I think probably looking out 20 years, you're gonna find that almost every private equity fund has sold a piece of its management company and carried interest to somebody else because people are monetizing that value today. It's crazy. I don't believe in that one either, frankly. I don't think we'll ever, at least while I'm there, we're never gonna do it. Because it's, it's, it creates a different dynamic among your people. You sold off a piece of your future to another institution. What do you tell the person who just started with you about the future? And you know, we sh all, our, all my partners are equal in management fee and carry. And that's what we strive for. We want equality, we want to bring everybody up, and you don't give away your future just because you've made a lot of money. So I think you're gonna see more and more of that, and, and going public too. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, sure. there's some that have gone public. I, I wanna go back to the retail, I think, Mike, your, your comment. Um, th there are some groups, there's a local group that's done very well that has sold retail through um, commission-based organizations, uh, credit products, uh, and with big fees, 
in, in, in a number of places. Uh, and I do question that, um, uh, you know, in, in, a high, in, in an interest rate environment where they can underwrite and get some decent interest rate, it seems to be working. Uh, but uh, what we all do is not for the faint of heart. And, and there are quite a few high net worth investors that, under, uh, that, that don't understand sometimes when they're an investor in a vehicle like, like what we have. I've had a few, uh, and, and those conversations are not, they're painful conversations when you realize you're misaligned, that they shouldn't have been an investor. Uh, that said, I do think that the notion of going to high net worth investors will incre become increasingly prevalent, particularly with groups that are SEC registrants that have good brands, may, may, maybe not at the size of the Blackstones of the world or the Sequoias of the world, um, number one. N number two, I think we're going to see a lot more products uh, out there for uh, high net worth investors and institutional investors from private equity firms and or growth funds uh, like co-investment vehicles, um, you know, pr pro rata vehicles, uh, continuation vehicles. Uh, there, there will be a continued um, um, set of things. We did a continuation vehicle, which I'd never heard of a year and a half ago. Uh, and, and explain it to everybody. Yeah, continuation vehicle, it sort of gets to the issue that, that, that Ed brought up. We had a bunch of assets in our third fund um, that we thought could really go long, and one of which is going into a SPAC. Um, and so it turned out we were right in that regard, one of which we were taking public, which we did. I said we didn't take a public, but we merged it with a public company. We own now more than half the public company. Anyhow, we had a timeline. Some of our investors may have wanted their capital back. These are institutions. We don't get pressure from high net worth investors. We do get pressure sometimes from institutions that, for whatever reason, have some form of, of requirement. Uh, so we offered, um, we brought in a buyer who, who placed an offer, we number of offers that came in. We offered it to our LP base. Anybody that wanted to, to leave could leave. The buyer wanted us to monetize 100% of our carry, which was about $50 million for us. I declined 100% of it. I said, no, we're going to roll. Uh, we're not going to sell one, sh one penny of our uh, carried interest because that's misaligned. I, I don't want our departing LPs to think we want to depart because we want to stay with these companies and see it through. So that is going to proliferate. You're going to see much, much more of that. And so we extended the clock another five years for those assets, which were eight companies that we had in that particular fund. And that fund looks like it'll be a 3X net fund now. Have we sold them prematurely? Probably would have been about a 2.3, 2.4X net uh, vehicle. Yeah, so we looked at investing in funds like that, and we have not been able to get over the hurdle of what's the valuation when we come in as a secondary. You know, when you invest in a fund, a de novo fund, you put a dollar in, you got a dollar invested. But when you invest in a perpetual fund, somebody's got to put a mark on it. And, you know, for us, every time we looked at it, you know, we didn't agree with the marks. See, and the markets just are very smart, and maybe the, uh, the markets are very smart. The, the, the typical person says, oh, private equity is a short-term horizon and there's pressure to get out. But now two things have happened. One, w we can take an asset in our fund and sell it into one of these continuation funds. We can go another five to 10 years. So we can go, and the second thing that's happened is the institution that wants to get out of Mike's fund, there's an enormous tens of billions of dollars of capital has been raised just to buy private equity interest and create a market in funds. It's very so there's no, the time horizon is off, as far as I'm concerned. If you want to get out, there's a fluid market created to buy your interest in the fund. And if you want to have a longer hold, you do a continuation fund. And so Graham, to me, there's no time horizon. I think that's one of the things that could change. So we've actually started our own internal secondary operation, you know, where we're looking to buy secondary interest in LPs. Again, looking to save money, right? You know, I think we can buy, you know, a dollar for 90 cents. And I think that is something that will continue to grow and could create more liquidity and c could create more opportunity. But the one part that you mentioned about you're willing to pay 50 basis points more all day long, that's a difficult one for us to swallow. I mean, we want to pay 50 basis points less all day long, almost in everything we look at, either the fee, the carry, whatever it is. Because after a while, you look at these returns, you know, no offense, but you know, two and 20, 
that's a lot, you know, and, and I'm the one who used to get it in a hedge fund, which was, you know, you know stealing money. But well, I, I want to thank our panelists. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Philadelphia investment community, these are four of the best minds uh, when it comes to investments in Philadelphia. So, so thank you. If we can give them a round of applause.